Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome again to our live stream, uh, which I have kind of in tongue in cheek been referring to as First Baptist Church of Stryker 2.0. We're continuing to only do the live stream services as we uh, all go through this uh, Corona pandemic restrictions. And I don't know if you've been watching the news. If you have, maybe you have heard that they are talking about uh, rolling out a progressive plan for easing up on some of these restrictions. And it'll be a phased plan, from what I understand. Uh, phase one is scheduled to start sometime after uh, the 1st of May, although I, I don't think that's been made official yet, but that's what they're talking about. Uh, but it, in phase one, they would only have gatherings of up to 10. And so uh, chances are we would not uh, meet again as a church under phase one. But when we get to phase two, which is supposed to uh, open up gatherings of up to 50, as long as you maintain uh, social distancing uh, and of course we would still expect people who are at high risk uh, to stay home uh, and I haven't had a chance to talk to our church leaders about this yet but I anticipate when we get to phase two whenever that is and we'll wait to hear from our uh, governmental leaders about that we would once again open the doors and invite people to start coming back to church again so uh, something for us to look forward to and I hope that you're praying about that in the meantime we will continue to offer these live streams and we will also um, uh, be doing some of the other things that we're doing. So, for example, don't forget about our, our uh, midweek Bible study that we're doing on Zoom on Wednesday nights. It starts at 6 p.m. with a, a time of uh, some songs and a challenge from the Word for the young people. And then at 7 o'clock for the adults. And uh, we, if you need to get involved in that, all you will need is the ID number and the password uh, for the uh, the zoom application and uh if j all you just need to do is ask we'll be more than happy to send you that information or better yet get on our email list because then not only will you get get that email you'll get our other communications as well like our prayer list and so forth um and and so um uh let us know if you need any help getting that set up um now next week sunday um we're going to be focusing on the national day of prayer which is may 7th uh, that which is the following Thursday, and so that's going to be the focus of our uh, our time together next week. And what we'd like to do is we would like to be able to pray together. Now, how can we do that when we can't even get together? Well, what we're going to ask you to do is to record a short prayer on video. You can do this easily if you have a smartphone uh, or a tablet uh, or even a laptop. And once again, if you need help, just let us know. We'll be happy to walk you through it. But we want you to record. A, a short prayer this can be about anything it can be about the coronavirus uh, pandemic it can be anything that's on your heart and mind even something personal keep it to about one or two minutes and then we're going to edit that together and show that next week so that we can all pray together uh, in this emphasis as we look forward to the national day of prayer on may 7th so we hope that you'll take time to do that and uh, send it to tim so he can get you can do that right away by the way you don't have to wait do it sooner rather than later to give him time to put that together, and we'll enjoy that all together next week. Um, but for now, we want to get to our time of worship, and so let's uh, sing these songs of praise together. You can stand up and sing out loud, even if you're at home uh, by yourself, and we'll have Tim come and lead us in the singing. Good morning, everybody. Psalm 100 says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his people. We are his, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. The chorus of the song that we're going to sing, Sing to the King, says, Come, let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. He's all we need. So let's uh, sing together.
song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the Returning, we watch and we pray. We will be ready the dawn of that day. We'll join in singing with all the redeemed. Satan is vanquished and Jesus is. A song declaring we belong to Jesus. He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King. Amen. He is the King, and we should raise our hearts and our hands to Him. Lamentations 3, kind of switching gears, but uh, still something to praise God about. Lamentations 3, 22 to 23 says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Aren't we glad about that? And then it concludes with, Great is your faithfulness. Let's sing, Come People of the Risen King. His grace, 
Over all the world his people sing, shore to shore we hear them call. The truth that cries through every age, our God is all in all. Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice, one heart, one voice, O Church of God. should be rejoicing even in uh, trying times when we're stuck at home and when we're all alone. We can rejoice that his love never fails and his mercies endure forever. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate that singing. Um, also appreciate that... Oh, I got ahead of myself there. Um, there. <laughs> Uh, also appreciate that all of you continue to send in your offerings by mail or online. We had our biggest online uh, offering of the year uh, this last week. So thank you very much for that. Uh, that is continuing to help us to do the ministry here. And uh, we are on budget. So uh, that is uh, just a tribute to your faithfulness. And we appreciate it so much. Thank you for continuing to send in your tithes and offerings. Uh, we do want to take now uh, some time for our prayer focus. And of course, uh, we have been uh, going through our church covenant line by line. And the last, uh, uh, well, last week and then a couple of weeks before the Easter holiday, we have been focusing on uh, the part of our covenant which talks about uh, watching over one another. We've seen a number of ways that we're doing that. Last week, we talked about how we watch over one another by cultivating Christian sympathy and courtesy and speech. And this week, um, it is uh, 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 the last sentence in the fourth paragraph. So we are now going to, we're finishing up, we're almost to the end of this discussion of our church covenant. And, and the last uh, one that we're going to deal with is uh, watching over one another in brotherly love uh, by um, being slow to take offense uh, and always ready for reconciliation and mindful of the rule of our Savior to secure it without delay. Um, this is very closely related to the last one. Uh, obviously, the way we, we speak to one another, the way we uh, care for one another is going to have a direct relationship to if we are quick to take offense to one another. And I think that, that most of us have at least one hot button, that one thing that is uh, really going to set you off. Um, some people maybe even have more than one. Uh, but we all have that one thing, right, that really sticks in our craw, that really gets to us. But we have to recognize that um, in those situations, uh, that's my problem. That's not the problem of the person who said what it is that set me off. That's coming from within me. Uh, and so I have to keep that under control. Um, and I find that the easiest way to do this, if somebody says something that, that offends me, that, that uh, strikes me the wrong way, the best thing that I can do is to not assume the worst. Um, in other words, what I want to do is I want to, I want to uh, assume or, or start from the point of view that, that what I heard may not necessarily have been what they actually said. Uh, maybe I didn't hear it right. Or maybe they didn't communicate uh, well. Or maybe I misunderstood what it was they were trying to say. Um, or maybe even just somebody had a bad day and they're having trouble controlling themselves as well. And so rather than assume the worst, jump to, the, to a conclusion, I want to take a step back and, uh, and start from the point of assuming that maybe that there is another aspect to the story here. And if I'm not going to assume, then what I need to do is I need to go to the person and I need to talk about it with them directly. I have to ask these questions. I have to find out exactly what um, was said and what was intended. Um, and that's the next part. Uh, not only are we to be slow to take offense, but always be ready for reconciliation. That's what 
reconciliation is. It is repairing a damaged relationship. And if we're going to do that, um, it means that I don't wait for them. I don't wait uh, until the person who has offended me comes to me about it. I'm the one that has to take the initiative. And when I do that, I open the door to um, them being able to repent and for me being able to forgive. If I don't say anything, it could be that they're not even aware that what they said has offended me. And so I'm the one that has to take the initiative. And then notice that it also references here being mindful of the rule of our Savior. Well, what's the rule of our Savior? That is referred to in Matthew chapter 18. And I'm sure you're all familiar with it, where Jesus said, if a brother offends you, go and tell it to that brother one to one. And there's a process, if that doesn't work, that we follow Next we bring two or three, and then ultimately bring to the church. But that is the rule of our Savior, that we are supposed to go and try to achieve reconciliation by talking to one another about these things. And then lastly, notice it says to secure it without delay. And that's a reference to what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4 and 26 when he said, don't let the sun go down on your anger. We need to, to do these things sooner than, than later, because when we... When we put it off, it only makes it worse. These things fester, and they become like an open sore, a wound that only gets more difficult with time. So it's better to do it sooner rather than later. So um, following this part of co our covenant, if we do this, to, to be slow to take offense, ready for reconciliation by following the commands of Jesus and of Paul, then what we will find is that not only will this help us to not take offense too quickly, but also to restore our relationships quickly when something has offended us. So uh, let's pray together um, this, uh, this part of our, our covenant that we would be a fellowship that is uh, characterized by being slow to take offense and quick to reconcile with one another. Our Heavenly Father, whenever you put two humans together um, or more, there's bound to be conflict. Um, we're, we're not perfect. We're going to do or say something from time to time that is, that is going to result in somebody taking offense. Uh, we may not mean to do it, or we may, not, we may regret it when we do it, but it's going to happen. And so we need to watch ourselves, or we need to make sure that, there's, that, that what's causing effect, uh, offense is not something within me that I'm allowing to, uh, to get ahead of the situation. I need to make sure that I go to the person who has uh, said something that I've been offended by, make sure that I understand uh, what they meant and what was intended, and follow the steps laid out by Jesus in Matthew 18 to bring about reconciliation. Uh, and we need to do this not just within our fellowship, but with others outside our fellowship as well. This should be how we are characterized. And I pray, Lord, that, that this would be a church that people recognize um, not that we're perfect, not that we don't have problems, but that we are very quick to try to resolve those problems in a way that gives honor and glory to you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, that's a good reminder that uh, we should be... Stop. We should be the first to uh, go ahead and offer uh, reconciliation. So let's uh, let's continue and sing victory in Jesus.
Now we made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming. in Jesus Christ. Let's sing again. I need thee every hour.
Thank you, Tim. Appreciate that, and uh, I hope that was as much a blessing to you as it is to me. Uh, we're now going to turn to our study of God's Word, and uh, we're going to be taking a trip uh, through a lot of the scriptures today, instead of parking on one verse as we or one passage as we often do. So uh, have your Bibles ready, and uh, we're going to start in James chapter four. Um, but before we do, let me pray and ask God to bless our time together, Heavenly Father. We do need you every hour. We need you every minute, Lord. Uh, we can't um, accomplish what you've called us to do. In fact, we can't even live. We can't take a single breath without you uh, sustaining us. And so, Lord, we acknowledge that today, that you are supreme. You are the creator. You are the, the Lord of the universe, and we need you. And we need you now as we open your word that you would help us to understand what you've written here and to apply it to our lives. We ask that that would take place in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, to say that things have not gone according to plan these past several months would be <laughs> an understatement. This morning's service, for example, was supposed to be a baptism service, and we have a number of people that are waiting to be baptized well that's not happening it's kind of hard to maintain social distancing um, when you have to get in the tank of water together uh, this coming wednesday would have been our final week of converge would have been a time of uh, of singing praise songs and uh, listening to testimonies and uh, and really celebrating what god had accomplished um, that year in um, in Converge. Um, instead, uh, between the snow and the coronavirus, uh, we, we literally only met twice in the last two months. Uh, we, we managed to finish seven of the 13 lessons that we had scheduled uh, for this semester. Uh, we didn't even really get to properly say goodbye to our teens and our kids, much less to invite them to come back next year. Um, and then right after that, Kathy and I were supposed to go on our 30th anniversary vacation. Uh, we were going to go to Europe. We had a big, big trip planned. We were going to Athens, Greece, and Rome, Italy, and uh, even a quick stopover in Paris, France. Well, that's canceled. Um, and I'm sure that most of you have experienced a lot of similar things in the last month, as, as I have. Uh, we're all going through this together. Your schedules have been impacted just as much as mine, just as much as the church. And I've heard a, a lot of different adjectives used to describe what we're going through right now. I've heard people refer to it as uh, interesting, uh, crazy, strange. I just heard that one yesterday. Inconvenient, certainly. Uh, uncertain. That one's popular. You, you hear that on a lot of commercials. These uncertain times that we're in. I've even heard people use the word scary. And I think that those all uh, are true. They're ac those are accurate descriptions of what we're going through right now. But I've also heard more than one adjective that isn't as accurate as it could be. Uh, for example, um, unprecedented. Have you heard any people refer to these days as unprecedented? Um, I don't think they are. Um, I, may, I don't know if you've realize this i certainly didn't but uh, of course i've i've been encouraged to to study history about these things uh, recently uh, in the last 200 years there have been seven cholera pandemics and at least one of those which took place in the late 19th century in russia was responsible for one million deaths in russia alone um we've also had four influenza pandemics in the last 
100 years or so, uh, and I'm sure you've heard of these referred to, there was the Spanish flu um, pandemic in 1918, and then the most recent one was the bird flu, the H1N1 virus in 2009. And that's, this is not even talking about like uh, the Black Plague, which we're all familiar with, which was in the 13th century. So are these times unprecedented? I don't think they are. Uh, our world has experienced these kind of events before. Well, how about unusual? You heard that one? People uh, referring to these days as unusual. I I'm not too sure about that one either. In order for something to be unusual, you have to be able to define what you mean by usual. And here in uh, uh, 2020, especially in America, I doubt you could get any group of people to agree on what constitutes usual. What somebody thinks of as usual, I may think find very unusual and vice versa. Um, and then there's um, the group of words like uh, surprising or unexpected. And, and perhaps that is true for some people. But for the Christian, it shouldn't be. Uh, because the Bible teaches us that we are supposed to expect the unexpected. Um, and that doesn't mean that, we're, that we can foresee what's going to happen. Nobody could have foreseen how this pandemic would play out and what we're dealing with right now. But what it, what it means is that we are supposed to know and understand that we're not in control. And so... Um, we see this all over the Bible, but we're going to turn specifically to James chapter 4. And it's, I know it's a very familiar passage to most of you. Uh, in fact, I think it's even been preached uh, in our fellowship not too long ago. One of our missionaries focused on this verse. Uh, but I'm not going to go through it uh, word by word. I, I'm just going to use it to kind of set the tone for what we're going to be doing this morning. And when we come to James chapter 4... Um, this chapter deals with all sorts of things that Christians are supposed to avoid, behaviors that we are not supposed to engage in. So, for example, uh, in chapter 4, verse 4, we see that we are not supposed to be friends with the world. And then um, uh, in verse 8, uh, we're warned against being double-minded. And in verse 11, uh, that we're not supposed to be judgmental. Okay, So the, this whole chapter deals with things that we're supposed to avoid. And then we come to verse 13 where it says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. The main idea in this passage is not that we are to avoid planning. That's not the point. Just because we can't uh, control events, that we can't see what's going to happen, sometimes uh, the unexpected takes place. That doesn't mean we shouldn't plan. But what this passage is telling us to avoid is um, boasting and arrogance in our plans. You see that in verse 16 when we have overconfidence in our plans, when we start thinking that we are in control, that is actually a form of pride. And, and notice that he even calls this type of behavior evil in verse 16. Um, that, that's a very strong word. And because it's that strong, it should give us pause. But what I want you to notice here is what is the remedy to this? The remedy is in uh, verse 15, where it says that instead we ought to say, if the Lord wills, uh, we should do this or that. So um, uh, it's hard for us to be proud or arrogant in our plans when we recognize that we're not in control, but God is. And we like to use the word sovereign when we talk about this. Sovereign is a word that means uh, supreme or ultimate power. We often use it to refer to uh, rulers like kings and queens and emperors. Uh, but really, only God is truly sovereign. He is the only one who can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, 
with absolute 100% success. Even the plans of kings and queens and emperors, they're going to be frustrated from time to time. Have you noticed what's been going on in, in England? Where, where Prince Harry has decided to divest himself of his royal duties and, and move even out of England. I don't think Queen Elizabeth planned for that to happen. And I don't think she's too happy about it. Uh, the point is, she's not even really in control, even though we refer to her as a sovereign monarch. Only God is truly sovereign. A good example of this is, uh, is Nebuchadnezzar. And, and you remember the story in Daniel chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar is kind of patting himself on the back, boasting, just like James was talking about, about uh, this great empire that he has created and all the stuff that he's done. And as soon as he does that, God says to him, oh no, you don't even understand. And he uh, puts Nebuchadnezzar into a situation where for seven years he begins to act like uh, like a cattle and he lives outside and on all fours and he eats grass and after he's done and he's restored uh to his right mind um he he says this great prayer in which he uh shows that he's learned his lesson that he now recognizes that he is not the one in control god is and he sums it up in daniel chapter 4 and verse 35 where it says all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing he meaning god does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth no one can restrain his hand or say to him what have you done nebuchadnezzar was one of the greatest monarchs that ever existed on the planet but he was not truly sovereign only god is truly sovereign jesus also talked about this in luke chapter 12 and i'll invite you to turn there with me in uh, your copy of the scriptures luke chapter 12 uh, jesus tells a, a parable here um, he's speaking with the disciples and uh, we're going to look at verses 16 through 21 uh, where jesus said or well first uh the uh he's speaking to the uh to the disciples it says then he spoke a par parable to them saying uh, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully and he thought within himself saying what shall i do since i have no room to store my crops so he said i will do this i will pull down my barns and build greater and there i will store all my crops and my goods and I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So he who lays up treasure for himself um, and is not rich toward God. Now, once again, uh, this is talking about something that is um, uh, that we're to avoid, some behavior that we're not to uh, to uh, engage with. But he's not saying that it's wrong for us to to uh, earn a good income and store up for retirement or anything like that. That's not what he's trying to say. What he is trying to say is when we when we make uh, plans, when we think we're in control, and we make those plans only to fulfill our worldly desires we're only thinking about ourselves and once again what do we see here god is the one in control because in verse 20 god is the one who says to him no uh, your plans are not going to work out the way that you expect it's going to go a completely different way i think the ultimate example of this of course is what we see and we just studied this uh, a few weeks ago uh, jesus in the garden of gethsemane when he is praying on the night before his arrest praying to the father and he says uh, father if it's possible let this cup pass from me but then he says nevertheless not my will but your will and the thing we have to understand about that is that god didn't just allow those events to take place he actually orchestrated those events uh, 
you think about this for a second. Ten days after the ascension, Jesus goes back to sit at the right hand of the Father. Once again, all of Israel has come and gathered in Jerusalem for the Feast of Weeks. That was one of the three um, big feasts that all of uh, the Israelites were supposed to participate in. So they're back in Jerusalem uh, just 50 days after uh, Jesus' uh, uh, death and resurrection. And um, on that day, we call it the day of Pentecost now, Peter preached the very first Christian sermon in human history. And on that day, 3,000 people uh, were saved and were added to the church. And in the, the course of his, uh, of his sermon, Peter said very many things. But one of the things that he said, I think is very uh, important as we look at this passage, uh, as we talk about this topic. Look at Acts chapter 2. And starting in verse 22, Peter says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. Did you, did you notice that? He was delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. The events leading up to Jesus' death didn't just happen. They were orchestrated by God to go exactly according to his plan. And um, he's actually going to mention this again. It's going to be repeated in Acts chapter 4. He's praying together with some of the disciples. And if you look in Acts uh, Chapter 4, verse 27. Notice it says, For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. God is the one who orchestrated these events. It didn't happen by accident. Now, whenever we talk about passages like this, it seems that... uh, always somebody will raise the objection, but what about free will? If you think about it, free will is just another way of saying control. When I say I have free will, I'm saying I am in control. Now we do have free will, I believe that, but our free will is limited. I can pursue whatever I will, but I won't necessarily get what I want. For example, the other day, uh, Kathy and I went to McDonald's to pick up some food through the drive-thru. You know, you can't go in anymore, but we were going through the drive-thru, and Kathy wanted a grilled chicken sandwich. In her will, her pursuit of what she wanted, that's what she wanted, grilled chicken sandwich. Well, as it turns out, during these restrictions, uh, McDonald's has a, a limited menu. They're not offering all the food they used to offer anymore. And one of the things they're not offering right now is grilled chicken sandwich. I don't know why, but they're not. Okay, She couldn't get a grilled chicken sandwich. That's what she wanted. That's what her will was. She couldn't make it happen. Um, And there are other choices, things that I want to do, but no matter how desperately I want it, I cannot make it happen. Um, One of the big issues in our society today is gender identity. I'm sure you've heard about this in the news. And there are some people now who are claiming that it is wrong for us to assign uh, gender to a baby when it's born, that we're not supposed to do that. What we're supposed to do is we're supposed to wait and let them decide for themselves when they become old enough. This is ridiculous. Okay. This is absolutely ridiculous. Gender is defined by our DNA. We either have an XX chromosome or we have an XY chromosome. Okay, That determines whether we are male or female. Or if we want to put it in biblical terms, God created us male and female according to our kinds. Okay, This is not optional. This is not something that you and I get to decide. We may have free will, but our free will cannot determine this. And yes, there are, there are people now uh, who want to identify as something other than the way they were born. We hear about this all the time. A man may say, well, I identify as a woman. 
Well, that's fine. You can go ahead and identify by a woman, as a woman if you want, and you can grow your hair long, and you can wear dresses, and you can even um, do things like uh, take hormones or, or undergo gender reassignment uh, surgery. But, you know, that's just an illusion. All it does is create the outward appearance of that. You still have the same DNA. And um, all the efforts that you can go to, whatever surgery, whatever you decide to wear, whatever hormones you take, this will not help a man who chooses to identify as a woman to get pregnant and to deliver a baby. It can't be done. His physiology will not allow it because he does not have the free will to simply decide what gender he wants to be. So our free will, as much as we have it, it is limited. And we have to understand that there are even times when God will suppress our free will in order to orchestrate events. The best example of this is found in Romans chapter 9, uh, verse 17. Romans nine seventeen, And this is uh, Paul commenting on... Uh, a, a history uh, at during the time of the Exodus. And he says, for the scripture says to the Pharaoh, this is God speaking for this very purpose. I have raised you up that I may show you my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills and whom he wills. He hardens God hardened the will of Pharaoh to refuse to let the Israelites go 10 times. And he did that on purpose. And I know that this is not a popular passage of scripture, but here it is. We have to deal with this. And I think this is one of the best examples of God suppressing our free will. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this today, uh, but I am going to in my next series. After we get past Mother's Day, I'm going to be starting a new series uh, on the life of Moses. We'll be looking at a lot of uh, the events of the Exodus, including the plagues. And we'll get to deal with this in detail. So come back for that. But for right now, I'm mentioning it because it shows that God can and does impose his will um, over us. And of course, the, eje- the objection that's raised to this point of view is usually, hey, wait a second. God is not a puppet master. Or another way they sometimes say is, hey, he didn't create us to be automatons and i think that both of these statements are true i don't think god is a puppet master and we are not automatons Uh, the problem is in thinking that this is somehow an all or nothing proposition either we have unlimited free will or i am just a marionette with god pulling the strings and i don't think it has to be that way i think sometimes god imposes his will but not always. In fact, I'd even go so far as to say not often, very often our limited free will and God's sovereignty work hand in hand. Uh, And in most cases, he doesn't have to suppress our will. All he has to do is just let us exercise our own wills and that will bring about his will. So for example, going back to Uh, the, The Easter story again. Did God manipulate Pontius Pilate and the Sanhedrin to crucify Jesus? When we read those passages in the book of Acts talking about uh, that God determined this, that it was accomplished by his hand. Does that mean that he had to somehow manipulate Pontius Pilate and the Sanhedrin in order to bring that back? Or did he simply send Jesus back to that particular time, that particular place, knowing what was in the hearts of Pontius Pilate and the Jewish leaders and knowing what the results of their choices would be. I think God is smart enough to do that. We live in a fallen world and that fallen world includes sin. So very often God doesn't have to make people do anything. He can just let them follow the evil desires that they are already inclined toward, knowing what will happen. Now, this fallen world that we live in also includes other forces. It's not just sin is one of these things that 
that uh, limits our free will and determines how we will act. Uh, there are other things as well. And um, apart from free will, and I, th- I think a perfect example of this is found is jo- in John chapter 9. Turn with me to John chapter 9. Here Jesus is having another conversation uh, with the disciples. And in verse 1 it says, As Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Um, Notice that the disciples' assumption is that um, this blindness that this man has had has to be the result of sin. Somebody must have done something wrong for him to end up this way. So their assumption is it's like a punishment. Okay, It's the result of some wrong behavior. And since he has been blind since birth, this opens up the possibility for them that maybe it wasn't his own sin, but rather the sin of his parents that has caused this blindness. And Jesus makes it very clear in verse 3. He says, no, it's neither one. It has nothing to do with sin. The reason why this man is blind, he says, is so that the works of God should be revealed in him. And I don't think that we need to conclude then that what this means is that, that God zapped him at birth, like he would have been normally born just fine but god went no zap you're going to be blind and he left him to suffer his whole life just waiting for this moment what's more likely is that the man was born this born this way because of a birth defect it's the natural result of this broken sin cursed world that we live in which includes things like diseases and birth defects now in this particular case, if that's, the, if that's what happened, if um, this man's blindness is just the result of a, f- a fallen, sin-cursed world, and God didn't put this blindness on him, couldn't God have intervened? Couldn't God have stepped in and said, well, I'm going to heal him. I'm not going to let him be born blind. Absolutely, he could have. So then the question is, why didn't he? And the answer to that one is that he allows these things to happen in our lives for our good. God could intervene, but sometimes he lets these things play out according to his sovereign will. Now, let me show you another important example. Okay, and this time we're going to turn back to Luke chapter 13. Luke 13. And we're going to look at the first six verses together. So Luke 13, starting in verse 1. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, Do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, the point of this passage is talking about um, how much sin is necessary before uh, we would be judged by God. And the point Jesus is trying to make is um, you don't have to be this this vile, terrible sinner (laughs) just a little bit of sin is enough to bring you under God's judgment. That's the main point. But what I want you to see here is that um, uh, the disciples bring up uh, this event about Pilate um, mingling blood with their sacrifices. And we don't know what the exact um, historical event is. We don't have any record of it. But uh, um, it is consistent with things that we know about Pilate's rule from other Uh, historical sources but what makes it significant is that whatever else might happen um, people have lost their lives blood has been shed and then jesus goes on to bring up a second event he refer he also refers to this tower that uh, collapsed in siloam and fell and fell and killed a bunch of people now here's the question did god was God responsible for this? Did God 
as some puppet master uh, pulling the strings and and Pilate was just uh, this uh, this vessel, this instrument of his will. And God is the one that killed these people and mixed their blood with the sacrifices. No, of course not. Sim- and also in the other one, did God push this tower over on people? Was he mad that day or was he having a rough day? And these people, he just felt like, uh, you know, I'm going to push this thing over on these people. I'm mad at him. No. That's not what's happening here, okay? But the point that I want you to see is that in this fallen world, things happen. Injustices happen and people die. Accidents happen. Towers collapse and people die. And many times when our plans don't work out, you know, it's it's not that big of a deal. Some of the things I talked about earlier this morning, the fact that church is closed. Yeah, well... It's been inconvenient, but church is going to reopen eventually. And that includes Converge. We will get Converge going again. Um, Kathy and I are going to have a vacation eventually, I'm sure. It may not be exactly the same thing we were planning. It might look completely different, but we're going to have opportunities to go on vacation uh, sometime in the future. Um, It's not that big a deal, really. We can live with it, right? But what happens when plans go awry or or things happen that we're not expecting and there is no going back? What happens when people die? That's when we struggle with this idea of of God's sovereignty and the one that that he's in control of of things. Uh, Yesterday, I had an opportunity to go to the, the CDC website where they have the statistics on what's going on with this coronavirus. And as of yesterday, um, we're at somewhere in the neighborhood of 900,000 uh, cases of people contracting the coronaviruses and around 50,000 deaths. And that's just in the U.S. alone. That's not worldwide. That's just the U.S. And I realize, of course, that there's some disagreement about how accurate these figures are. You know, some people say, oh, they're grossly exaggerated. Other people say, no, there's a lot more because we're not doing the right kind of testing. I don't want to get into the politics of it. However many it is, people are dying from this thing. And the thing is that when, when the person who dies is someone that you care about, when it's your loved one, you don't care about the statistics. All you know is this person has been taken from you and they're not coming back. Maybe you've also seen the uh, the protests that were going on this week. People wanting to to end these restrictions and get life back to normal. And once again, there's this huge disagreement on both sides. Forget about that for a second. Just ask yourself, why? Why are these people protesting? What makes them want to get back uh, to normal? Well, some of them are going out of business. This, uh, this, shutdown has affected some people's business to the point where they may never recover. They might go bankruptcy. And if you're faced with bankruptcy, if you don't know how you're going to feed the kids next week, you don't know how you're going to pay your mortgage. That's when things start to get real. And even if we disagree about these things, we can still have compassion and, and, um, and feel what people are going through. People have lost loved ones who have died because of this virus. People are in danger of losing their livelihoods, their homes because of this, this, this virus. And when, when our plans don't work out the way we expect it, and especially you're facing like something like that, and it's, it's, there's no going back. It's going to just be over. Our plans are are not just frustrated, but the results are irreversible. That's when we have to turn to Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, which is the promise that God gave us. And I know that you know it's a very popular verse that people quote it all the time. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. But when we're faced with the loss of a loved one, with with a business closing, with losing all of our worldly possessions, 
it can become a real struggle, a real test of our faith to believe that Romans 8.28 is true. It's so hard for us to see sometimes. How can this person that I love so dearly being dead, how can that be for good? How can me going bankrupt, losing my business and my house, how can that be good? And sometimes we just can't see it. Now there are times in our lives when, when we are blessed and eventually it, it gets to a point where we can see the good even if we can't when we're right in the middle of it. Think about Joseph. Remember, remember Joseph's story? He was uh, ambushed by his brothers. He was sold into slavery. Then uh, Potiphar's wife uh, you know, bare, bore false witness against him. He ended up in prison. This went on for years. And I'm sure at, at one point or another in that whole experience, there were times when Joseph was going, God, what's happening? Wh- wh- what are you doing in my life? But then eventually, he is released from prison. He, he interprets Pharaoh's dream, and as a result, he's, he's elevated to a position of great power, great honor. And years later, after he's reunited with his family, his brothers come to him, and they're worried that he's going to do something to get revenge. And in Genesis chapter 50, verse 19, Joseph says, No, you don't understand. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. And sometimes we get lucky. We get to see those things in our lifetimes. Um, Jesus, once again, He's the supreme example. Uh, His suffering, His death, from a human perspective, they're all bad things. But from an eternal perspective, we know that that is what accomplished the salvation of the entire world. So sometimes we do get to see the good that comes out of these difficult times. But not always. We're not guaranteed that. I I think about Job. Did Job ever find out why he had to go through the suffering that he went through? Why did he uh, lose his entire family? All his children were killed. He lost all his possessions. And and for a, a long time, his body was ravaged by disease. Did he ever find out what the purpose of that was? If he did, it doesn't appear in his book anywhere. Uh, may, I mean, maybe he did, but we're not we don't see it in the book of job the only thing that we see is uh god comes to him and says hey what are you complaining for what are you talking about you you don't have any understanding here you you need to trust me and he doesn't say this is why he just says you need to believe to trust that that i know what i'm doing perhaps we will sometime somehow learn the good that comes from the difficult situations that we go through, but there is no guarantee. And so in closing this morning, um, the question that I want us to think about is this. How can we trust in God's control when things don't go the way we expect? And I think that stories like like Joseph and, and, and Jesus and Job are written for this very reason, uh, to help us to remember what God has done before. Uh, So even if we can't see it in in our own circumstances, even if I can't see any good that's coming from it, just the fact that I know Joseph went through tough times and it had a purpose. Jesus went through tough times and it had a purpose. That helps me to have confidence that what I'm going through also has a purpose because the same God that was in control of those circumstances is in control of mine. And I think of especially 1 Corinthians chapter 10 10 and verse 11, which says, Now all these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. See, we can turn to the Bible and we can read about how God worked in other people's lives and know that he is working in our, our lives the same way. So we, we trust in God's control when we remember what He has done before. Secondly, we trust in God's control when we focus on eternity. And let's go back to where we started. James chapter 4. Um, and I'll just remind you of uh, what it says here in, uh, in verse 14, the second half. It says, For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. 
And what James is reminding us there is that our lives are so brief. They are so temporary in comparison to eternity that it's just like a vapor that passes away. Other places in Scripture were referred to to grass. Here today, gone tomorrow. Uh, our lives are so short. And um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, Paul puts it this way. He says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And that's what we have to remind ourselves, is that our lives are nothing compared to eternity. Even if we should be on this earth 80, 90, 100 years. Remember the words of the old hymn. When we've been there 10,000 years, there'll be no less days to sing God's praise than when we've just begun. 10,000 years into eternity, we're just getting started. And we're going to look back and we're going to think, man, why did I get so uptight about that 60, 70, 80 years I spent on earth? It was nothing. It was a drop in the bucket. And so if we focus on eternity, if we keep our, our minds fixed on what is to come, and not the circumstance that we find in ourselves in now, that will help us to trust in God's control when things don't go as we expect. Now, how is God using this coronavirus uh, for good? I don't know. I honestly don't know. Maybe we will someday. In any case, even if I did know, the answer to that question is going to be different for me than it is for you. But, but I believe it. And I trust it. I trust the God of Joseph, the God who worked through Jesus' suffering and death to accomplish good, to do the same thing in my life. And I pray that you can as well. Our Heavenly Father, these are difficult times. They are strange. They are interesting. But for those of us that have our hope in eternity, they are not unexpected. They are not surprising because we know that you have told us to be prepared for anything, to, to hold our plans loosely because they could change at any time. And Lord, when that happens, we can go with the flow, trusting that whatever it is you're doing, even though I can't see it and it, it isn't what I was hoping for, it is intended for my good. And help us to be reminded of that in these days, Lord. And help us to remind others by our words, by our testimony, by how we respond to these trying times. And that you would receive all the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. He is a good, good father. If you uh, tuned into one of our daily dollops a week or so ago, uh, Chris Tomlin uh, wrote this song. And uh, it's just good to remember that God is in control. Um, he loves us. And uh, I'm reminded of the scripture that says, um, how much more will he watch out for us? Uh, and give us good gifts um, then even we take care of our own children so um, he is in control uh, second verse of this says I've seen many searching for answers far and wide but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide so uh, let's sing together stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whispers of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm 
never alone. Your good, good Father, to you are, to you are, to you are, and I'm loved by you. To I am, to I am, to I am. Searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide because you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father to you are. To you are, to you are, and I'm loved by you. To I am, to I am, to I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Love so undeniable I can hardly speak peace so Unexplainable, I can hardly think as you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still into love, 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 you're a good, good father, to you are. To you are, and I'm loved by you. To I am, to I am, to I am. Your good, good Father. To you are, to you are, to you are, and I'm loved by you. To I am, to I am, to I am. Father, we just thank you that you call us your children. That when we worry about things that uh, are important to us, that you, like a father, cares for his child, care for us. And we just thank you and praise you that uh, you, the creator of the universe, is mindful of us and our concerns in that even while we were sinners, you came and died on the cross for our sins. Father, we just pray uh, that we would uh, glorify you and exemplify you in our lives this week. In your name we pray. Amen.